there's now a mosque that stands Inside. next to the original uh, entry, and one can't go in and out of there, uh, which is understandable. But I think actually it's authentic. And uh, I think it's wonderful to go down there and sing songs, yeah, for instance, is. sing hymns. And so when we think of, uh, of, we have a nice little place in the cemetery where we go and we have a little plot, but a sepulcher would have been probably caves in the, the rock opening in the areas, and there's lots of rock in that area, so they would have taken him down into this cave and then seal it up with a, with a stone. And sometimes I think we, we forget the scriptural phrase in the Old Testament of being uh, gathered to your fathers, that we, we don't do that in our Western culture, but he may have had his own parents or ancestors buried in the same cave as well. But it would have been a, a family plot of some sort as, associated with this good friend family of, uh, of Jesus. Well, now, how did, why, does, uh, why does Martha not want him to move away the stone? She is, at this point, with the amount of time that's gone by and the weather there in the Middle East, this is uh, springtime, it can get fairly warm, that the body's already begin and begun to decay. So she says, let's not remove the stone. And literally, it would have sat down on top of this... Um, the sepulchre, mm -hmm. and and you can actually see the ridge that that stone would have sat on if this were the it was the authentic. And I I believe like you do, Kent, that this is an authentic site. That stone would have sat on there. It would have taken something to get it off to begin mm -hmm. with. These were not light uh, stones to cover it. But you know, in, in, interestingly, <coughs> as Kent pointed out earlier, he's given her what you call the secret of the ages. She has borne her testimony. Yet when push comes to shove, to literally move the stone, she's not quite sure about this yet. But consider the miracle that he's about to perform. I mean, he's raised the, the daughter of Jairus, and, and he's raised the widow's son in Nain. Yeah, but nothing but, like this. But this is a whole different miracle that he's going to perform. Well, and, and that's why I say is that, that all of us, at some time or another, we have faith, but then the real testing of that faith. We may know the secret of the ages, but someday that's going to be really tested. Uh, C.S. Lewis makes a very interesting observation. He says it's one thing to have faith in, in life after death if your faith is compared to a string that is used to wrap a package. But he says if your faith is a rope that you have to hang on over a cliff, that's a different story mm -hmm. altogether. And in reality, now, push has come to shove, is is Jesus able to do the very thing that he said to Martha? You notice how they tie this into the man that he's healed blind, mm -hmm. from, uh, that was born blind, is that the two seem to go together. Only one from God mm -hmm. is able this. to do this type of miracle. Mm -hmm. Becomes another witness, even in their own tradition now, that he is the Messiah. You know, I like two, two symbol symbolisms here. One is uh, verse 44, that he came forth, they call him, you know, out of the grave with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus comes out. But then Why a loud voice? I've, I've often read that passage, and I just wonder. Well, he's dead. Got to call loudly for him to hear. Okay, well, I, just, I, I don't know. Uh, that's as good an explanation as I've come up with, but it's just uh, interesting. It's, it seems know. to be contrary. When we administer to someone, we don't always shout or anything. It's just an interesting observation. Go ahead. Well, when he comes forth, he turns to others and say, loose his grave clothes from him. In a way, that's the miracle of Christ's life and atonement. We are to go forward and help loosen the grave clothes that all of us are bound with. We're all bound with traditions. We're all bound with assumptions. We're all bound with weaknesses or illnesses. And the Savior's call to us is to help one another, to unbind the things that hold us back from receiving the Savior. The second thought is, you know, the Savior rose and laid aside his burial clothes, and he's asking Lazarus now to stand and lay aside his burial clothes. Every time I go to the temple, and I go down to the dressing room, and I lay aside the clothing that one day I'll be buried in, I remember the Savior did that first. Hmm. And because of him, one day we'll all rise and, and receive eternal life. Well, you know, and it's also, in, in some ways, it may even be a little bit of a test of the faith of those that are thereby. Uh, you know, if, if Martha doesn't want the stone to be pulled aside because of, of the decay and all of that, 
now he's saying you have to get up close to that person and you un unwrap him do you really believe that when I said arise and come forth and he's come forth do you really believe that this miracle has occurred once again this is the same continued theme we've seen all through John even from the very beginning this notion of of lightness versus darkness of coming out of the darkness into light coming from death into life it's just a constant teaching that John wants us to understand that our salvation is by turning to the Savior relying upon him when he calls us to come forth out of darkness into light and, it, and it's back to that that theme that we've mentioned uh, that Brother Brown taught us earlier over and over again of the perception and how you perceive it because look in verse 45 we once again see this sifting in verse 45 that it says and many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done and that leads to that sifting because the rest of this chapter then tells us how those that didn't believe this miracle or maybe we ought to say believe the miracle more than they wanted to believe it how they're going to respond to it so what do the Pharisees do about this now well in verse 53 I maybe didn't want to jump that far That's fine. they take counsel together and how to put Christ to death and in chapter 12 verse 10 they also want to put Lazarus to yeah, death. Yeah, get rid of the evidence. But isn't that a bad idea? If the Savior raised him from the dead once, <laughs> what makes you think you can take him out and have him not come back? It's just insane thinking. Again, these overwhelming miracles they just deny. No wonder the condemnation yeah. of the Savior the last week in the temple is so strong against these people. And this is so indisputable, the only way we can explain it is to bury the evidence. But look at, look at something, and as we go back to verses 49 and 50, there's a imp very important passage there that I think uh, is a good way as we end this discussion of chapter 11. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all because of all the discussion of what are we going to do about this Jesus, and what are we going to do about all these miracles, and then notice what he says. You don't know anything. I've got the solution for you. Look at verse 50 nor consider that it is expedient for us, it's absolutely necessary for us politically and so forth, that one man should die for the people that the whole nation perish not. What a great irony and yet an ironical prophecy. They want to get rid of Jesus because here he is, this evidence that they want to get rid of him and that he has to die so that they can live. Little did they know that by virtue of him dying and rising again, they would indeed live.